Hey there, guys. This is Zombie Wildman Hall, and today I want to talk to you about what I learned from reading a plethora of military history books back in 2021, roughly two years ago. So um, I don't know where it came from, but I felt this intense desire um, in the midst of the whole COVID mania and all that stuff um, that I, I just felt this need to study military history. And specifically what I want to study was who are the great generals and uh, what were the overlying themes that I could draw from different eras of military history? Because my thinking at the time was, okay, there must be uh, over overlying strategies that work across space and time, right? And I, I actually did discovered that there, there were some overlying uh, concepts to success in military uh, combat and, and uh, just campaigns that were universal across different uh, technology eras, uh, different environments, um, all sorts of different variables. But uh, so that's what this video is about. And I think it's a highly interesting subject. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to spoil what I learned right away. I, I, I want to get down to what I studied first, but um, I, I, at the end of this video, I want to talk about how what I learned from reading these military history books and studying these these great military geniuses, these military generals, um, how does that apply to us in modern age as just individuals, as, as men, as us going through life? So um, first off, I just wanted to go over some of the great minds that I read books about and studied. So uh, of course, there was Hannibal, uh, the Carthaginian general, who was just an absolute mastermind, absolute mastermind. He had Rome on their back foot, and in Rome were some real badasses. So that's where I actually started, and I didn't even read a book. Um, but there was a, I, I started with this really great history channel on YouTube called History March, and I'll link that here. And it, he does, I think it's a 10-part series about Hannibal. Um, and the Carthaginians and and uh, you know the you know the, uh, I believe it's the Punic Wars and uh, dude it's absolutely worth watching, incredibly interesting, and so um the big thing uh is that Hannibal always picked the battle right. He always had his enemies on the back foot. He was always surprising. He was bold, and not only that, but he had the the faith of his men. His men were unwavering, so um, they wouldn't break in battle. When he gave them an order, a unit to do this or that, they did it. When he told them to hold the line, they held the line. Um, when they were going to lure the enemy in and then, you know, uh, surprise them, whatever it is, um, they did that. And you see this across uh, all across military history is that uh, the really great generals, the great leaders, they inspire confidence. And when they inspire confidence, the, you know, there's less um, mistakes made that you know, they, they follow orders because they have faith in what the general's doing. So the fair, general tells them to retreat, they retreat. When the general tells them to fight, they fight. You know, when the general tells them to flank, whatever. Um, so you know, um, it, yeah, it was, it was just you know, the, and, and because that he could actually they had the faith, you know, that they could follow a military plan. They won't uh, just panic and fall apart and just get too aggressive or flee or retreat. So um, anyway, reading, you know, learning about Hannibal, that led me to um, uh, Rome's 10th Legion. I read this book, that the 10th Legion, and I was really curious, why was Rome so successful militarily? Because they're fighting, uh, you know, uh, the Celtics, you know, uh, which are basically, at, at that time, they're actually in France, but, you know, they're all across Germany, uh, elsewhere, all Northern Europe. Uh these barbarian tribes were like a good head, taller and bigger, fierce fighters, absolute fierce fighters. Um, but the Romans were beating them consistently. And so what I found interesting about the, the Romans is that um, I, I would compare them to modern day the United States. They, they had an institutionalized system of recruiting and training uh, of core soldiers that became professional soldiers, you know, a very uh, organized, very disciplined soldiers. So one of the things that impressed me about uh, the Roman centurions and you know, just uh, the Roman legion, um, 
one day, they were just tough. They marched every day. They marched all over the damn place. And then they were, and wherever they got, they're digging a ditch because there's standard Roman military practice that you dig a ditch, uh, uh, you know, a giant square that's 10 feet high and then 10 feet below uh, from where you dump the, the earth out of it around their camp. So these guys were strong and uh, they liked to recruit them from the countryside because um, they felt that they're stronger and they're tougher and they're able to go without food uh, more easily because that's part of being a soldier. It, you can ask a soldier today. Um, yeah, ask any soldier going through the ranger school. Um, part of being a, a, an infantry man is, is going without food, you know, and, and that goes all the way back to the Romans. You know, they had to march tens of miles every day, sometimes without food. Um Another thing that's really interesting about them is that, uh, I don't know if this is interesting, but um, pillaging was part of the, the boon of being a soldier. So uh, that was part of warfare. When you go into enemy territory, you got to pillage the cities that were there. You got to take whatever you wanted. And then um, a reality was rape was part of that. They would rape the women that were there. Um you know, so, so and then uh, the spoils of pillaging that that all got divided equally among the men. They didn't go up to the officers or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, you know, to, to me that the the Romans were just extremely organized. Everything was broken down to units, um, you know, like by numbers and just went up sequentially. Um, you know, like they just they fought as units. Like even when you got recruited into the Roman Legion, they'd automatically pair you with some other person. And that was basically your body for life throughout your military career, your 20, 30 year military career. Uh the guy next to you was your best friend from then on, and you guys got each other's back. And then that system of loyalty expanded upwards until the, the whole legion, right? Um, so I mean that yeah, the book I read about the, the Roman 10th Legion, um listen, the Romans were some savages. They're absolute. I mean, these are the same people that crucified Jesus Christ, right? So they were fucking savages. Um, but they, damn, were they organized? Damn, were they organized? You know, and, and just the engineering was pretty incredible, and, and just um, like they they had it together. They had an institution. It was bigger than a person. It was like an actual institution that would carry on beyond the person, right? So after the Roman Legion, I, I got really interested in uh, the Mongolians. And uh, I'd always heard that uh, Genghis Khan's uh, best general was someone named Subutai. It was a strategic genius. So I, I read a book about him. And what I learned about the Mongolians was actually quite interesting. So really what it came down to, I, I was under the impression that Mongolians were just tougher soldiers than everyone. And although they were incredibly tough and savage and violent and uh, Really, the reason that they were able to beat so many other very well-organized and well-trained armies and empires was their mobility. It was the, that the whole army was mounted on horses. So they always got to pick and choose the battle. So, for instance, you know, if, if there's a heavily armed, uh, armored enemy with knights and this and that, um, and they felt that they were outnumbered, they just ride the horses a couple hundred miles to another part of the country, start attacking, you know, sowing chaos, doing what they do. And they could literally, they can move their whole army because those all on horses, uh, you know, they can move it a couple hundred miles within a week. That's something most armies at that time couldn't do at all, you know? So um, they're able to pick when the battle took place. You know, they, they would fight when it was in their advantage. When it wasn't, they'd keep on going. Um, so that, that was something that really surprised me about the Mongolians, you know, um, it, uh, so that was quite interesting. Um, let's see, from there, I studied the Zulus. Now, the Zulus, if you're not familiar, that they're basically a, a, a warrior tribe, a warrior empire, and, and what's now modern day, uh, kind of like, you know, it's South Africa, you know, but kind of like more, uh, Northern and Eastern South Africa. And uh, so the Zulus were, were basically a nation of warriors and uh, you know, they, they caused trouble for everyone around them. They're beating them. Right. And, but they uh, fought with, you know, spear and this kind of uh, raw cow, not raw, but a uh, cowhide shield. And uh, 
but they're very organized. And so what I realized about them after reading the whole book uh, about them is, is one, uh, warfare and, and soldiering was part of their culture. It was embedded in the whole way the society was organized was around this. So basically, um, once again, they're very organized. There was a system in place where each tribe, each each village would supply warriors up the, the command. So it, it was in such a way that, you know, if you're the king of, of the Zulus, um, you had a system in place for recruiting and, and organizing and drawing upon these different regiments from all across your country, right? And so I, even even with them, they're, they're kind of a, a kind of a primitive military uh, you know, technology, but then they still that what was setting them apart from everyone around them was they had this institutionalized system of recruitment, of training. It was just part of their society. Um, and it just made them very effective. How, however, you might feel about them, love them or hate them in India, any of these armies, you know, they worked. They, they were effective at what they did, which is uh, warfare, fighting, fighting. Um, so, of course, naturally, my studies took me towards uh, Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. So I read uh, more than 1,000 page book called The Campaigns of Napoleon Bonaparte. Incredibly interesting book. Uh, a little bit dry at times, but definitely worth reading, especially if you're a military buff. So I had always heard that Napoleon Bonaparte was a military genius, this and that. And, and I wanted to know why, right? So this is what I learned about Napoleon the Bonaparte, right? Is that um, the, the French army, I, I believe, is a result of the French Revolution. So up until that point, if you look at Europe, you look at the main adversaries of, of France uh, at that point, right? Uh, of the Napoleonic era. And it was England, uh, Austria, Prussia, Russia, um, and to a lesser extent, some other countries. You know, like, like France invaded uh, Spain and some other places that they took over. So um, all these other countries were, were rooted in old nobility. So the way that their uh, militaries were organized is the way to promotion was by um, basically what was your political affiliation? Who are you related to? Who are your friends? It wasn't based on merit. So someone like Napoleon, who was uh, an artillery officer, um, which you know was a field of the army that depended less on your background, more on your skill, and um, you know he, he was he was definitely cutthroat. He was definitely playing the game, trying to, you know, playing the political game, all this stuff, right? Um, but, you know, basically he survived the French Revolution where everyone was literally losing their heads. And uh, once he got in command, so what he started doing with, with France is, um, you know, the whole French model of Napoleon on the was that war should pay for itself. So the French army marched on not more than three days of rations. And the idea is they would always pillage as they went across the countryside from you know whatever countries that they're going across. So they basically get their supplies as they're going across, right? And uh, this allowed them to move faster. Uh, and by comparison, the Austrian army always marched with at least 10 days rations for all their units, right? It slowed them down. They couldn't move as fast because they had to carry all that supply with them. Um, so, you know, Typically, the, the French army would move on like 100 mile front or, or longer. They'd be all broken up in different parts, moving east. And then at a certain point, you know, as they're sending the riders back and forth and they're getting information, um, at a certain point, he would converge the army onto the point that he wanted to attack and, and generally overwhelm the enemy. And then, so, so you see a re recurring theme here? Uh, he, because he was more mobile, mobile was able to pick the time and place where the battle took place and because he was more mobile he was able to uh, you know, concentrate more troops where he wanted the fight to take place so you know another just odd thing i, I realized uh, the major obstacle or one of the major obstacles to warfare in europe was crossing rivers uh, having a good engineering corps that could build bridges was essential to warfare in europe it never even crossed my mind i thought that was so interesting 
Um, so a, another thing about the Napoleon Wars and, and Napoleon is that uh, everyone knows about how he went into Russia and he lost so many soldiers and he lost it to the winter. Well, it turns out, although did many soldiers did die in the winter, the, the vast majority died during that summer um, because they died from sickness. And it was actually a, a, a unordinarily you know, un hot summer, right? Um, so basically, he, as he went into Russia, he knew that he wouldn't be able to live off the land like he normally did. So he had, he had actually made adjustments to have supply chains backing them up. But the problem is that the army was so far ahead, it was still like two or three days ahead of the supply chains. So um, one of the things that they lacked was water. And so uh, uh, the majority of the soldiers that died from that campaign were, was from uh, sickness and disease. And a lot of it was because they were drinking dirty water because the only water that was available was the ditch water on the side of the roads they were marching on. And um, because a lot of their horses and animals were dying, a lot of them ended up in that ditch water that they were drinking from. So it was completely contaminated. And they're, they're just, you know, shitting themselves, dying, whatever have you. And so uh, very few people died in bad. Most of it was this really hot summer. They're dying from sickness. Uh, Napoleon actually took Moscow. He took it for a month, and then he thought he was going to be able to, to negotiate something, but they just held out long enough, and then he ended up going back, uh, retreating. And then one of the problems he had was that because it was such a warm year, a lot of the, the rivers he was hoping to cross when they're freezing over had it frozen over. So that caused a big problem coming back. And the, yes, at the end, many soldiers did die. Um from from you know like freezing to death but if you look at that numbers it was like a, a small fraction uh you know so it, it's just weird to hear all these myths and, and stuff and uh you know you just look at the facts yourself and you see it's like oh this uh, that's just what it is it's a myth it's not actually rooted in the facts um and that was another thing when uh napoleon lost at waterloo he actually should have won that battle and it was just um a bunch of Luke coincidence has happened. Basically, he had some, in particular, one general that didn't do what he was supposed to. So, I, if I remember correctly, there was three main groups he had split up. Two of them were engaged, and then one was a, a reserve. And if the reserve had chosen to either follow the orders for to go here or do what he was going to do before and support the other one, they would have won that battle still. Um, so, sometimes fate is just against you. It's your time to win or it's your time to lose. But um, yeah, listen, Napoleon, he was uh, definitely a military genius, right? Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll stop the video there stuff. Uh, if you haven't figured out my main point of what I learned, and, and I learned a lot from reading these books, and, and I, I just recommend everyone study history. You don't have to study military history, but I would try to find something that interests you and through that paradigm, through that perspective, try to study history. So if, if you love art, try to study different eras or different artists at different times. Re read biographies. Biographies are one of the greatest things. You get to see someone else's life, their life stories, their successes, their mistakes. You can learn so much and apply it to your own life. Like if you want to be a better or smarter person, just start reading biographies. Start there. If you're just an average person looking to get better, start reading biographies. Um, and biographies are too long to start reading obituaries in the newspaper. That's a really great, just read one obituary a day and you're going to start to get a perspective on other people. Just what should I be doing? What should I not be doing? Um, but yeah, yeah. You know, going back to my point though, um, you know, I, I think, you know, yeah, if you, if you love art, if you love science, if you love politics, uh, you name it, whatever it is you love, just find it in history or a person in history and just uh, use that to learn about the history of the time, but also just learn whatever it is you're interested in. Um, so, yeah, the, the overarching theme that I learned from studying military history is that uh, whether, whether you're Hitler, Patton, you know, Genghis Khan, um, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte, the man who is able to pick uh, where and when the battle takes place, 
he is the person who's going to consistently come out ahead. And it makes sense, right? It's like, I don't know, you're playing a game of dice, but, you know, you're only going to play the game of dice when, uh, you know, I don't know, just uh, when the odds are in the field, right? I, I, you get my, my freaking points, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, uh, it's like, uh, are, are you going to roll the dice when you have a three-sided dice that can come up a one, two, or three? Or are you going to roll the dice when you have a 20-sided die? You, you have a one to 20, you know, uh, one out of 20 chance that you're going to get it. Right, like you do it when the odds are in your favor, right? When you had the advantage, and if I look at this like martial arts, right? Um, how can we apply this to martial arts like MMA, boxing, all this stuff? Is um, the person in this case, I would say, who has the best mobility, the best footwork, who's able to get into range, get out of range, right? Is going to win the battle, right? They, um, all, all these people, the people who are able to get into the position they want to be, right? Um, I think this applies to relationships, right? I think this, um, do not enter an argument unless you feel that it is the right time, that you have an advantage, right? Do not enter into altercation. There's a, a time and a place to pick and choose your battles, right? Like, uh, there was a time to argue with the guy uh you know out that you know on, on a road rage situation or something but there's a lot of times where maybe you really shouldn't maybe you're just um it's, it's not a good situation maybe you don't feel you have the advantage um no maybe it's just you have too much to lose maybe your kid's watching you right uh, you have your kid around you um you need to Pick and choose your battles, right? You always hear that phrase, pick and choose your battles. Um, well, you know, th there's something to it, right? And uh, this could be at work, right? And, um, you know, don't try to argue with your boss until maybe you get some more information, until you have some information that can give you a, a leg up, right? Like, um, I, no, I, I want you to think about it. if you're watching this right now, and you know, where can you apply this in your life? When is it the appropriate time to start a battle? Well, when is the appropriate time not to? And how can you increase your ability to dictate when that happens, right? Uh, I, I say the first off is have control of your own emotions, right? Easier said than done. I understand that. But um, if you can understand that by not by having you in control of your emotions, you know, whether it's your anger, your fear, um, frustration, you know, whatever that emotion might be that that's causing you to act in a way that that you haven't decided to act, you're just reacting. Think about that. You know, uh, how can you do that? Right? Um, how can you be in control? Uh, I, I think part of it comes down to confidence, right? It's easy for me to walk away from a fight if I know that I can kick that guy's ass. Why do I think no I can kick that guy's ass? Well, maybe because I've trained martial arts many years and I got to fight people in the gym and I, I know if I'm gonna fight this guy, I'm probably gonna send him to the hospital, right? So I don't need to prove anything, right? It's I get to pick and choose the battle. I, I'm in control of my emotions because I know even though, though this guy's being a dick, I have the option to walk away because. I'm not any less of a man. I have confidence. So maybe the answer is how do you control your emotions? Gain confidence. How do you gain confidence? Gain proficiency proficiency in that skill, which you don't feel confidence. You know, like like maybe you get really upset when you get rejected by women. You ask them out, this and that. And why is that? Well, you know, maybe, you know, if you get more confidence, more success by trying to do it more, it won't bother you so much, right? Um, once again, either easier said than done, right? But, um, you know, th there's a million things, but, it, you know, I, I think of like, once again, the example, if you're at work, right? Um, it's easy to take an insult if you have confidence that later on, you, you'll be able to do something about it. 
and, and no, I'm not talking about kicking someone's ass or anything like that. I'm talking about um, if someone's trying to bully you, like a supervisor or, or whatever, if you know, if you have confidence that, hey, if I go back and whatever it might be, you know, handle the situation by approaching it this way or bringing up that point or this point or whatever it might be, or, or just, um, I don't know, you know, calling in sick. I don't know. You know, like, um, you know, it, the point is pick and choose your battles, right? And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, anyway, I'm, I'm going to end this video now. Um, but it, yeah, it, it was like a, a venture. I went forward reading all these military history books and, uh, I got what I wanted out of it. I, I learned a lot of life lessons, uh, a lot learned a lot of strategic lessons. And a lot of them I haven't even talked about in this video because, you know, it's a really broad topic that, you know, and, and I'm just bringing out little, little vignettes, right? Like just the little anecdotes, this and that of well, important points I remember. But I, I would recommend you read these books also because you will probably take some new things out of it yourself right uh and uh you know take some uh, you know learn some new points some some new ideas um and uh anyway i'm zavi wildman hall you guys are awesome until the next time take care guys